All right, now I, I kind of alluded to this earlier this morning. I preached a sermon this morning about, it, the title of the sermon was, you know, Admit That You're Wrong. It was the title of the sermon. And we went a lot of in-depth as to how God wants us to be able to acknowledge our sins. When we do something wrong, maybe we do things wrong, we didn't know it was a sin before, it was done ignorantly, but when we realize, hey, what I did was wrong, to be able to just come out and just say, God, I'm sorry, what I did was wrong. And tonight, it's going to be kind of, you know, a, a continuation in a way of that same sermon because what we're going to be looking at tonight now is just turning back to God and, and returning unto God with your whole heart and, and having, getting your heart right with Him. There's many people today that, um, and I know myself is a perfect example of this. I got saved when I was 20 years old. That's when I put my faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And for a short period of time, I, I had a zeal and I wanted to learn and grow and, and wanted to go to church and do some things like that. But it didn't last very long. My, my flesh didn't change. And I'll tell you, this, the, the moment you got, you got saved, your flesh didn't change. You still have the same body. You still are the same person that you were before. Now, yes, there is a new creature that's born again inside of you. And praise the Lord for that. That is the new man that the Bible describes where there's a war that's going to go on daily between the new man, your spirit that wants to do right, that wants to serve God, and you, st but you still have this old flesh that's going to be dragging you into sin and trying to get you to do things that you don't really want to do, but that's going to make you feel good. You know, to getting the drunk, drunk and doing drugs and doing all these other things, committing fornication, committing adultery, all these things that your body thinks, hey, this is going to feel good, I want to do this, but that are just completely wrong according to God's Word. Your flesh is still going to try to get you to do those things. Now, whatever it was that you liked to do before, for me, example, just going into my personal life a little bit, before I was 20 years old, I liked to drink, I liked to do drugs, I liked to, to, to do things that were not right in the sight of the Lord, and I'm not going to get detailed on that, but there's just a lot of things I like to do. I got saved. Hey, I had a new creature born inside of me that wants to serve God, that wants to do right things, but the flesh didn't go away. So after that, there was a long period of time where, guess what? The flesh started to win over, and I started to just kind of ignore the new man. Just ignore the, the, the part of me that wants to do what's right and that wants to obey God. And you can do that. And, and as a person that God has given free will unto, you can be saved and still go down the wrong path and still do things that aren't right. Now, it's not good to do. God doesn't want us to do that. And God, well, God sure punished me throughout those years. There were many years during my life where I just wanted to keep doing the wrong thing. But there got to a point where I wanted to turn back to God. And unfortunately, God had to bring me real low in order to do that. And hopefully, the sermon tonight will help you so that you don't have to get to that point of, of being brought down real low before you decide, man, I'm going to turn back to God. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna just okay, God, fine, you got my attention. I'm gonna get back right with you. See, there's two ways you could learn. You could learn through your own experiences and learn the hard way by just going off and doing things, even though you know it's not right, and just reaping the consequences and then saying, Oh yeah, I shouldn't have been doing this. That was stupid. Or you could learn from other people. You could learn from God's word. You could learn from what his word already says and just say, Hey, I'm not gonna go down that route because God says not to do it. Hey, I know other people have gone down that road and I'm not going to go that way. What we see here is, and this is a pretty extreme example in, in Jeremiah chapter 3. Now he's referring more to the nation, the nation of Israel as a whole, not to an individual person. But we can look at this because it still is, is representative of God and who he is and how loving he is. Because God is a very loving God. Now everything that I was doing that was wrong, I was reaping what I was sowing. And God was disciplining me appropriately. But just the fact that God is so merciful and long-suffering that He even allows us to come back to Him and still will welcome us with open arms is incredible. I mean, I could think of some of the things that I've done. I'm just like, they're, they're disgusting. I'm ashamed of what I've done. Just utterly ashamed. But the fact that God's right there to say, okay, when you're, when you're willing to turn back to Him, He's right there for you. And we need to be able, whatever you might have done in the past, let's turn unto God. 
We're going to turn unto God. This is what, what we're teaching about. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 3. Let's look at some of the things he brings up here in the very beginning of the chapter. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, They say, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him and become another man's wife, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? So this is referring to, it's actually one of the laws of the, of the Old Testament. If you're married to a spouse and you get divorced, right? And let's say, let, let, let's just, you know, this didn't happen to me, but let's say, I was married to a woman before, we got divorced, she went off and became another man's husband. But then maybe she divorces him again, and we say, hey, well, let's get married, you know, and you want to try and reconcile that? The Bible says no. That's not something that you should do. You, you know, once that's already happened, you shouldn't, I mean, the Bible teaches you shouldn't get remarried anyways until your, your ex-spouse is, has, di has died, but that is considered polluted. It's considered something that, that's defiled, that you can't go back to that again. And this is what he's referring to in verse number one. And he says, but then he, he equates that type of a situation to the children of Israel. And he says, but thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. So he's telling them, return unto me. Look, you've done this. You've played the harlot with many horses, but, but I still want you to come back to me. See, what they were doing with the children of Israel and God judged them and punished them for is they forget the Lord. They started worshiping idols and, and false gods and, and they strayed from the Lord their God and got caught up in all these different false religions. And God's saying, and, and to him it's like you're cheating on God by going off with these other gods. You know, the Bible teaches us that God's a jealous God, that God wants our attention. He doesn't want you, because these false gods are not real gods anyways. The Bible couldn't be more clear about that. People make the, you know, they carve the wood and they overlay it with gold and they set it up and all this other stuff and they pray to it, worship to it, and it's an inanimate object. It's not a real God. And it's kind of laughable that people would even do that, yet people do that even to this day. People worship statues and, and objects that, that men make, they, that men make with their hands. And they worship them as if they're a God. And they are no God. But this is what the people were doing. And what they had done was they had rejected God from being their God. He, they rejected the Lord and they turned to these other gods. And that's like, you know, playing the harlot is the way he uses it. He's playing the whore. You're going off and running around with all these other religions and praying all these other false gods. But he's saying, I still want you to come back to me. And this is the heart that God has. He says, I want you reconciled unto me. I want you to come back to me. Now, because they're doing that, he's saying, look, I'm going to have to judge you. You're going to have to, to pay for this. You're, you know, the, the longer you continue just, just being away from me, you're going to receive from what you've done. It says in verse number two, lift up thine eyes unto the high places. Now, the high places are places where they would go to to worship false gods. This is, they would have groves and high places all throughout the Old Testament. You'll read that where they would set up these altars unto false gods and see where thou hast not been lying with. In the ways hast thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore, so he's saying because you've done this, therefore the showers have been withholden and thou hadst a whore's forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. So he's saying therefore because they did this, God withheld the showers, the rain, right? So when it's not raining, you're not going to be getting food, which is going to cause famine to go through. It's going to cause you to get hungry. It's going to cause you to experience pain. And this is what God was allowing them to go through and causing them to go through because they were not listening to him. They were, not, they were, they were playing the whore. They were going off and doing things they shouldn't have been doing. He says, Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me? My father, thou art the guide of my youth. So he's dealing here again with a nation. He's saying, aren't you going to come back to me? I'm your father. I'm the one who begat you, Israel. I'm the one who made you into a nation. You're, you got your beginning and your start with me, yet now you've gone off to all these other things and all these other people. Why won't you just come back to me as your father and just turn unto me? and realize that I am the guide ever from your youth. Verse number five, will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. Let's jump down here. 
Well, let's just keep reading here. Verse number six. The Lord said also unto me, in the days of Josiah the king, hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She is gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. But she returned not. Now think about this in the context and what he's saying here of how loving and how, how, and how gracious God is. If you were married to someone and they went off and played the whore on you and they went off and were just cheating on you with a bunch of different guys or a bunch of different girls and just kept on just, just doing this, all, or just, just being real filthy, right? For God to still have this attitude of saying, well, come, come back to me. I'm your husband. Come back to me. I'm your wife. Come back to me. I just want you to come back to me and, and you know, be done with all that that you're doing right now. This is the heart that God has, in, in this case, to Israel, but he also has this with us, also as his children. Now, it hurts him. Just like if you were to go out and commit adultery on your wife, you, you, you go out and do it, it's going to hurt really bad. There's a lot of pain there. There's a, there's a lot of, of uh, shame there and grief. And God is angry and he's upset when we go out and we, and we get involved in all this sin. But God still will not leave us. See, in the human example, we aren't God. What ought to happen when people get married is they ought to stay together for the duration of their marriage. That's the right thing. And that's a thing like God would expect. And see, because you make a vow and a promise, you say, I'm going to be there for you. That's why the for better and for worse is part of the, is part of the vows. Because it's for the worst times <laughs> that it's there. That's, that's why you need to make a promise. Hey, when things are going great, what's the, what do you even have to promise for? Everyone's having a good time. Of course you're not thinking about, about um, divorcing or anything like that. But when it's the bad times, when things fall real hard, that's why you have that promise there. You say, no, look, look, we, we promise you. My word means something. I'm going to stick by you. And, but see, people, you know, our heart gets hardened and things happen that, that are extremely difficult to deal with. And I'm not trying to understate what, what a horrible sin it is for someone to, to go out and play the whore or do something like that because it is extremely bad. And that's why the, the Bible actually puts the death penalty on people who commit adultery. It's what God intended for the laws to be that because it is such a grievous, serious sin of committing adultery on someone, that God said, look, if, if you go out and do this, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. God said that's the right thing to do in that situation because it is a horrible sin. The damage that it does to the family, to the spouse, to, everyone, to anyone else who's involved in that, it is incredible. And the only way that we can deal with that and with that type of wickedness is for that person to be put to death. It's a capital crime according to the Bible. And you might say, wow, man, that's extreme. I can't believe you're saying that. Hey, I'm just saying this is, this is what God handed down to Moses from the word of God himself. I mean, this is God's law that he had ordained. Now, I know that's not our law of the land today, but I believe it should be. I believe that the laws of God should be the laws of the land today. Now, they're not, so we don't take the law in our own hands or do anything foolish like that. We still have to abide by the laws of our government, but... The way that God intended it and the way that he views that wicked of sin, it is a serious sin. And even after stating all of that, we see the heart of God saying, come back to me. It is a sin worthy of death and he's still saying, come back to me. Come back. Stop doing what you're doing and come back to me. And, you know, even with our own salvations, we can see the great mercy and long suffering that God has with us. Because all of our sins are worthy of death. We all commit these capital crime sins we have in our past that we deserve to burn for that. But God just says, hey, call upon me, believe on me, and, you will, and, and I will forgive you of all the wrong that you've done. And, and praise the Lord for that. I'm so happy that we have such a loving God. You know, we read through the Old Testament, you could be like, what do you mean that's a loving God? You, know, you hear all this stuff and, and it sounds real angry and real nasty. Some, people, you know, some people will say like, well, I don't really like the God of the Old Testament. Hey, God doesn't change. The Old Testament, New Testament, God is God. He is who he is. You can hear the laws and be like, oh, well, that doesn't sound really good. You know, God's going to put someone to death for adultery. It's a serious sin. It really is. Don't downplay how wicked that is. 
But he loves us so much that even when that's committed, Abigail, sit down in your seat normal. When we do things like that, he's still willing for us to come back to him, to turn back unto God. That's what he said here. We saw it in, uh, in verse 7. Turn thou unto me. But she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw, verse 8, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Now when he's talking about the bill of divorce here, he's talking about when Israel was taken captive. Because it got to a point where, where they kept on, you know, they weren't listening to the Lord, they weren't listening to God, and, they, and God brought his judgment upon them to be taken captive. And he's saying, Judah saw all this happening to Israel, you know, the judgment of God coming down upon them, but they didn't change their ways either. They were basically doing the same exact thing. So God had to judge the children of Judah the, also. And uh, verse number 9 says, And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And that's the reference to idolatry, the stones, the stocks. Uh, verse number 10, And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah had not, returned, not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith the Lord. Now, God knows the heart. And what the feignedly means they faked it, right? He's saying like they turned to God like giving him lip service, like just using their mouth and, and, and just saying, oh yeah, God, we're sorry, but they didn't mean it at all in their heart. It was faked. Girls, go back by your mother right now. Right now. They didn't mean it one bit. And to me, it just seems kind of foolish. Like, like, you shouldn't just go through the motions of pretending like you're sorry for something when you're really not. God knows your heart. Go turn unto God with all of your heart. Return unto Him and, and don't hold on to these sins that you still like to do. Just get rid of them. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 11. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judy. Remember, we are talking this morning about people who want to just justify their own sins. That's exactly what's going on in this chapter here, that they're trying to make excuses for their sins instead of just turning unto God and being sorry for them. Verse number 12, Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return now backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. We went over this this morning. God wants us to acknowledge when we've done wrong. Just say, hey, look, I'm wrong. I didn't do the right thing. Acknowledge thy iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn. O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Now, the whole message tonight is, is about turning. Turn back to God. And what it really could be called is repent. Repenting is when you're turning back, when you're, when you're turning back to God. Now, a lot of people, and I don't, I don't want to spend the whole time on this, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. A lot of people have a false assumption when it comes to salvation. And this is taught widely, and you need to be aware of this, because there's a false doctrine out there that's going to tell you, you need to repent of all of your sins in order to be saved. It's not a true doctrine. Repent, the word repent, first of all, it means you're, you're, you're rethinking. That's what the word literally means. It's rethink. Uh, uh, if someone's pensive, it's an, kind of an older word. If someone's thought of as being pensive, that, that person is thoughtful. And that, that same P-E-N, that pence part of the word, is, is the same root as repent. And of course, re means again. So you're thinking again. You're, you're, you're changing your mind, basically. When you, when you see all the times that repent is used in the Bible, you're, you're changing your mind on doing one thing and you're doing something else. So many times, God has been, has been one, the one that repents because he was planning on doing one thing, but then he repents. He changes his mind and decides not to do that. So if you remember, for example, um, when Moses was given the Ten Commandments and he was going down the mountain and the children of Israel had made an idol and they were worshiping an idol and God was getting really angry with them. 
And God was going to destroy them all. And he was going to say, Moses, I'm just going to start fresh with you. And I'm going to destroy this people. That was what his plan was. Moses interceded for the children of Israel. He interceded for them and said, God, no, wait, you know, don't do this thing. Don't hurt them. You know, give them another chance. He's saying, you know, what are the, what are the heathen going to say? They're going to say that, that you brought them out in the wilderness because he delivered them from Egypt. He's saying, they're, they're just going to go and mock you and say that the only reason he delivered them from Egypt is so that he could kill them in the wilderness. And he was, you know, he was using all these different uh, things to... to, to persuade God to not destroy the children of Israel and he was interceding for them and God repented the Bible says and he, cha he changed his mind he decided okay I'm not going to destroy them because Moses interceded and that shows you a lot of things. I mean, that shows you the great the great power that one person can have and the prayer towards God and when we go to God we can we can ask him for things and we can actually make a difference and um but anyways, that's an example of God repenting. So the word repent, first of all, has nothing to do with sin inherently. Now, sometimes it can be used in the context of the sentence to be referring to sin, to be turning from sin, turning from wickedness. And we'll see that. We can see that in Jonah chapter 3. Keep your finger here in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 3. But if we turn to Jonah real, real quickly... It's a great proof text for letting the Bible define the words that it uses. It's an important subject just because it's taught so prevalently today that we have to repent of our sins. I mean, think of, what does that even mean? If you were to repent from your sins, just trying to think of what that, what that phrase even means. Okay, so that means I'm going to turn from all of my sins. Right? If I'm turning from all my sins, I'm putting them behind me. I'm not going to have anything to do with my sins anymore. Wouldn't that mean, if I were to turn from my sins, that would mean, hey, if I'm walking towards my sins, well, I'm going to turn from that. I'm going to walk the right way. I'm going to turn away from my sins. As soon as I sin again, am I going to be back going this way again? As soon as I sin again, does that mean that, did I really repent even? Because I'm heading right back this way again. The only way you can truly have repented is to never do it again. Just say, okay, I'm not going to do this, and you never do again. And I don't know anybody that has repented of all of their sins. So it can't be for salvation. You can't have to repent of all of your sins in order to be saved. For one, the Bible never says that you have to do that. When the Bible uses the word repent in regards to salvation, it never brings up sin. Sin is not mentioned in the context. But what is it then we have to repent of in order to be saved? Our belief. We have to rethink what we believe. We have to put our faith on Jesus Christ because prior to salvation, your, all of your faith was not on Christ for your salvation. It was on something else. It might have been on your good works. It might have been on something else. It might have been on another religion. You have to change what you believe in order to be saved. That's your repentance. That's what you're rethinking. Was, Whoa, wait a minute. I, I wasn't believing right. I was believing something else. Now I can put my faith on Christ. That's the repentance that's required for salvation. You're in Jonah chapter 3. Look at the last verse. Verse number 10. The Bible says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. So turning from your evil way, according to the Bible, is works. You're doing works by turning from your evil way. If repenting of all your sins would mean turning from your evil way, that's works. That's doing good works. Now, should we turn from our sins? Of course we should. I'm not saying not to. I'm just saying it's not a part of our salvation. Repenting of your sins, yes, repent of your sins every day. Turn away from those sins. Get them out of your life. Try to, to walk the good life. But hey, that's doing works. That's hard work trying to live the perfect life. That's hard work getting the sin out and doing what's right and following God's law is work. But the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's specifically talking about eternal life. That's specifically versus talking about salvation saying it's not of works. So if turning from your evil way is considered works, then how can that be a part of our salvation? There would be a, an inherent contradiction in the Bible. It says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do to, unto them, and he did it not. 
God saw their works, and then God ended up repenting. He was gonna, he was gonna hurt the people of Nineveh. He was gonna destroy the city. That's what evil is. He was gonna bring that evil upon them by destroying the city. But he changed his mind. He didn't do it. He repented what he said he was gonna do. So I just I wanted to bring that up real briefly because really what we're talking about tonight in turning back to God is repentance. We're we're changing we're changing our actions from what we were doing. So now we're going to be going, going in the direction that God wants us going in. But let's go back to Jeremiah, if you would. So one more section of this chapter I wanted to, to touch on before we move forward. Jeremiah chapter 3. Well, I'll start reading in verse 19. But I said... How shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the hosts of, a na of nations? And I said, Thou shalt call me my father and shalt not turn away from me. Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, a voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. God is still calling for the children of Israel to return. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. He's saying, I'll make it better. When you, when you come back to me, I will make it better. Sarah, can you go by mommy over here in the office, please? Mommy's in the office. Can you please go by mommy? Turn, if you would, to um, Malachi chapter number 3. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament before the New Testament. Malachi chapter number 3. Malachi chapter number 3. I'm going to read for you from Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah 44, verse 21 reads, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. And in those verses, God is explaining that I made you, I formed you, you're not going to be forgotten of by me. He even says, I've blotted out your sins. And when we get saved, God has blotted out all of our sins. He's not going to forget about us. But he says, return unto me. So even after you get saved, we need to return unto God. He says, for I have redeemed thee. Malachi chapter 3, look at verse number 5. Malachi 3, verse number 5. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed." Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? What I want to point out here in this chapter is verse number 7, where he says, Return unto me, and I will return unto you. So many times, and this will happen if, if you haven't been there before, uh, I've talked to a lot of people when... For one reason or another, you get caught up in sin, right? And you know you're doing wrong. Unfortunately, people have this attitude of not wanting to return unto God just because they feel so bad about what they've done and they say, oh, well, well God would, how would God ever welcome me back now? Right? If you ever get to this point where you say, you, you know what's right, you know what's wrong, you've been saved, God saved you, He's redeemed you, and then you start getting into sin and you start just, just thumbing your nose at God and being a rebellious child of God 
and just getting off into sin. And I've talked to people like this before that have, that have been saved, but you know they're living in sin, they're doing things that are wrong, and then they get to the point where they almost want to just give up. And they're just kind of like, well, I don't, I don't, I can't even go back to, you know, God's not, why would God even listen to me? Like, Look, God wants you to go back to him. And remember this now, you know, hopefully no one here is in very much sin. Hopefully, hopefully your life's going pretty well. But um, if that's ever not the case, if something ever happens down the road in the future, you know, who knows what the, what your life, what your life is going to bring, the decisions you're going to make in the future, who knows what's going to happen. Just remember that God always wants you to return unto him no matter what state that you're in. Don't let some false concept of how God is going to feel or act about you. He always wants you coming back. Don't be so ashamed that you feel like you can't go back to God. Humble yourself and go back to him. He says, return unto me and I will return unto you. That's a promise from God. He says, I will return unto you. It's going to happen. Just like in James chapter 4, verse 8, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Hey, when you try to get closer to God, he's going to meet you halfway. We don't have to do all the work ourselves. God's just wanting us to start going in the right direction. He said, start coming towards me. I'm going I'm to come right towards you. And he's going to close that gap really quickly. But you have to turn and start going towards him. In order, in order to meet God, in order to be there with God, you have to start turning towards him. But see, what we know about God and what is awesome about our God is that he is faithful. People are unfaithful. You can't always trust a person that's why there's so many divorces. You can't always trust a person. But you know what? God is the perfect faithful person. God is, when God says he's going to be there, when he says, I want you to return on me, he's there for you. He is there no matter what. And the best news is that it's no matter what. Once, once you're a child of God, he is, the, he is your father forever. The same way that, that I am my children's father. Nothing could change that ever. Nothing can ever change that. No matter what they do, no matter how bad they act in church, Elizabeth, sit in your seat. No matter what it is, I am always their father. I'm always going to love them. The same way is God with you. And if you draw nigh unto God, he will draw nigh unto you. He's going to draw closer to you. Turn, if you would, to um, Luke chapter 15. It's the last place I'll have you turn. It's going to be a little bit of a shorter sermon tonight. Luke chapter 15 in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read for you from Joel chapter 2. Joel is one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Joel chapter 2 verse 12 reads, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. What this is in context, what this is referring to is the day of the Lord that's going to come on this world. The day of the Lord when God comes back to pour out his judgment on this earth, he's giving them one last plea here. He's saying, look, even now when things have gotten really bad, Turn unto me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Show me, you know, be, you know, show me that you're sorry for what you've been doing and turn unto me with all of your heart and rend your heart. I break your heart for me and not your garments. It's not the outward appearance that I'm concerned about. It's your heart right now and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger. It takes God a long time to get angry. We don't got, want to get God angry because it takes him a long time to get angry. Once he does, he gets really angry. The Bible talks about the wrath of God. He has, severe, he, has, he has a lot of wrath, but he's very slow to get to that point. He's not on a hairpin trigger. He's not ready to just blow up at any second. It takes him a long time. And that's good for us. Because we do a lot of things that aren't right. And thank God he's slow to anger. He's gracious. He's merciful and of great kindness and repenteth of evil. And he's saying, look, who knows if God's going to change his mind, if he's going to return and repent and leave a blessing behind him. So even though you might think, oh, it is another thing that people will do. They'll think, well, I've already done this much sin. I might as well just go a little bit further. I, I, I already... You know, I already cracked open this beer and that beer. I might as well just finish off the six-pack because I've already done it. Look, stop wherever you're at. 
Just stop where you're ahead and, and don't just continue in that. Just say, look, you don't know. You say, oh, well, God's going to punish me anyways because I did this. Yeah, but if you, if you rend your heart, if you go to turn to God with all of your heart, he can be very gracious and merciful instead of having this attitude of just saying, well, I'm going to get it beaten anyways. I might as well just, just be as bad as I can be. It's a bad attitude to have because he'll come down even harder on you than that. But if you can truly just turn back unto God, he will show his mercy with you. Luke chapter 15 is the story of the prodigal son. We're going to close with this story. Luke chapter 15, again, it's a little bit more insight into God and who he is and, and how much he wants you to return. Now, the key to understanding this parable, this story, is found in verse 11 because this is the beginning of this parable. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 reads, And he said, A certain man had two sons. People will take this, this portion of Scripture, this parable, and they'll try to prop up false doctrines and teach all kinds of different things about this. But right off the bat, the very first verse says, A certain man had two sons. We're talking about two children of this man who, who owned this property, who owned this house. They were already sons. Now, when we get saved, that's when we become a son of God. John chapter 1, verse 13 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When we are believers in Christ, we become a child of God. We're born into that family. So right off the bat, what we're talking about here are two sons, people who are born into this family already. They're part of the family. Keep that in mind as we keep reading. Verse 12, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. So basically he's asking him for his inheritance early. Right? Normally you have to wait until your father passes before you receive the inheritance that he's laid up for you. And normally they would be working with him and, and working, they'd be growing and probably building more on, on the foundation that they already have and, and that their, their wealth would probably grow if he continued to work here with his father. He'd be saying, you know what, no, I want it right now. And of course, he's the younger one, right? The younger one saying, look, no, no, dad, I just want it right now. Me, you know, give it to me right now. I want to have it right now. That's with this credit card mentality. Well, I want to just buy this right now. I'm just going to put it on this charge card and I'll just worry about the, the problems later. No, give me my inheritance right now. So his dad says, okay, I'll do that. And he splits it up. He says, okay, here's for you. And here's for, the, for, for your brother. Verse 13, And not many days after, after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. So he takes that whole inheritance, he goes far away, he goes on a trip, blows all the money, the whole inheritance just blows it all. And it says here with riotous living. A riotous doesn't mean he was starting riots, but riotous means like, you know, he's partying it up. He's doing things that are, that are not wise at all. He's living a, th this, this lifestyle that, that is not good. It's a sinful lifestyle. He's living riotous and, and just wastes all the money, right? Verse 14, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in, in that land, and he began to be in want. So now all of his money's gone. Oh, he's got nothing left. And not only that, a famine comes. So like times are getting really tough. He's got nothing to eat. He says he, becomes, he began to be in want. He began to be in need. That word want is that he had need of things. He was in need of food. Verse 15, And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. See, before he was just sojourning, he was visiting. Now he's like, well, I need to like become a citizen so he could work. It says, And he sent him into his fields Excuse me, I misread that. It, when he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, he went and joined himself unto someone who was a citizen of that country. Someone else who lived there who already was a citizen trying to get hired and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. So he gets this job of feeding the swine and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. So now he has hit rock bottom. I mean, his job is to feed the pigs and he's looking at the food that he's feeding on the slop he's feeding to the pigs, wishing that he could be eating that food. That's how, I mean, that's how low now he has gotten. He went from having this great inheritance, yeah, living it up, party it up, now all the way down to the bottom where he is in the pig pen wishing he could eat their food. Verse 17, and when he came to himself, 
He said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. So now he starts thinking like, Hey, <laughs> before I left for home, my dad had people working for him. He had servants, and they had food. They weren't wishing they could eat the pig's food. They, he was, they were paid well. They had enough food to eat and even more to spare. They had enough. They were, they were living um, with, with plenty for themselves. So now he's saying, hey, I'm going to go back. I want to go back to my father because I had it good when I was there. Even the servants had it good there. And it says in verse number 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Now notice what he's doing here. He's, first, he's acknowledging that he's done wrong. That was the first part we went over this morning. Acknowledging that he's done wrong before God. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Verse 19, make me as one of thy hired servants. So he goes back to his father just with this plan of, look, I know I've already gotten the inheritance. I'm not worthy to be called your son, but please just hire me. I just want to work for you. You know, even if I'm no longer a son to you, just let me work. This is the humble attitude that he has now going back because he's been brought very low. Verse number 20, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, this parable is a picture of God being the Father and His sons being His children, God's children, right? If you're born again, you're a child of God. And like I said, people will try to use this many other ways to twist and bring up false doctrine. But it's very simple to understand. In this story, there is a good son and a bad son. Right? The good son stayed at home. He helped his father. He was working. He was doing what his dad wanted him to do and, and stayed working and doing the right thing. And the other son went off and got into sin, got into trouble, and, and ended up bringing himself really low and was down and out and lost everything. But look what happens here. When he decides to return back, he humbles himself. He acknowledges what he's done was wrong. And he decides, you know what? I'm going to go back. The father sees him, it says, when he was a far way off, which means that he was looking for him. When he sees him a far way off, he was out there looking for him. When he saw him, he had compassion on him, the Bible says, and he ran to him. He ran to meet him. He didn't just wait for him to make the whole long trek in by himself. As soon as he saw, as soon as he was able to see that he was coming back to him, to the father, he ran out there to meet him and embraced him and welcomed him with open arms. They end up killing the fatted calf and throwing this party because he decided to come to his great joy. So we need to keep this in mind. If you ever get to this point or if you've been to this point recently where you've been down and out, everything's going wrong, hey, turn unto God. Don't think that he's just going to reject you. He's waiting for you with open arms to come unto him. He's just waiting. He's come unto me. He's out there looking for his children to return unto him. And to return home. That's what God wants. What an amazing God that we have. It says in verse 21, And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. This is the attitude that God will have when you come back to him. Now, just want to point out, it doesn't mean that there were zero consequences for his actions. He wasted his inheritance. He didn't just get that back because he came back home. But he was welcomed back home, and he did start to do what's right again and, and, and be where he needed to be. But he ended up losing that inheritance. Now, I'm not saying this because I think you lose your salvation, but we can earn rewards for ourselves in heaven. There's going to be a time when Jesus Christ comes back, there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ, when all the believers in Jesus Christ are going to be raptured up and we're going to stand before Jesus and all the works that we've done for God are going to, are going to be tried in a fire before Him and whatever we've done that is of eternal value, we're going to receive a reward for that. All the good things that we've done and the hard work that we've done for the Lord, God's going to reward you for that. 
But I think that if we decide to just say, you know what, I don't want anything to do with this anymore and just go off and have this riotous living and stuff, we could lose those rewards. Those can just be burnt up. And that's why it's important, it's one of the reasons why it's important that we make sure this doesn't end. Now, if it happens to you, if you find yourself in a situation, hey, still go back to God. It's the right thing to do. He's going to be waiting there for you to embrace you and, and, be, and be happy that you're back with Him. But, um, you know, let's try not to even go down that path to begin with because it's still the wrong choice. And see, his brother, it goes on, and, you know, I'm not going to read the, the rest of the chapter, but his brother gets kind of angry. He's either like, well, why are we throwing a party for him? Like, you, you haven't even, you know, done anything like this for me and my friends before for anything. Why is it now he went, he had these prostitutes, he wasted all this money, he did all this bad stuff. Why are we throwing a party for him now, Dad? He and he explains, look, you've been with me this whole time. He says, all that I have is yours. Because his son now was going to reap for doing what's right, sticking his nose in day after day after day. It's not the exciting stuff. It's not the, you know, the flashy, like, like the, the younger brother went out and just lived it up, partied it up. He said, yeah, you didn't go and do that. Some people might say that's boring, but he did what was right. And he says, now all this stuff belongs to you. He was the sole inheritor of the whole estate. Everything that I have is yours. Don't be upset about that. Say so it's and he says he says it's important that we do this. You know, we're happy that your brother came back home. I mean, when he left, it was like he was as good as dead. I mean, he just went off and just did his own thing. Who knows what was happening to him? He's living a wicked lifestyle. Hey, now he's back. Now he's gonna do what's right. That's good. It's it's happy. It's good to be happy about that. But it still came at a cost to him also, right? There's still always a cost. We always have to keep that in mind that when we do wrong, there's still a cost for it. You could say, oh. If people like, don't like the argument about being saved forever, having eternal life, they'll say, oh, that means you can just go off and sin and, and it's just fine. No, it's not just fine. There are consequences for our actions. But it doesn't mean that But we still aren't going to go to hell. I mean, it's just, that's just the only consequence that's removed that God is not going to, to inflict on us. He's not going to send us to hell once we're saved. But there still are consequences for the things that we've done wrong. And um, you know, I believe even our rewards can be uh, held in the balance for, what, for the things that we do in this life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great stories in the Bible. God, I pray that you would please help us, first of all, just to always have the right heart and to never get wrapped up into, into sins and uh, having a riotous lifestyle like, like the prodigal son had here in this, in this story, dear God. But um, if we end up, if any of us ends up going down a route like that, dear Lord, I pray that you would please help us to remember that you're waiting for us to return unto you and that you will, you will receive us with your arms open and that we don't have to, to worry about um, being ashamed uh, so much that we can't turn back unto you, dear Lord. It would be a foolish thing to do. But that we should, we should be ashamed when we do wrong and we should grieve over it. But Lord, I pray that you please help us just to, to humble ourselves enough to come back to you and to start doing the right thing again, dear Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.